Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this second episode of the Osaku debates. My name is uh, Mohammed Ahmed Gain. I am the coordinator of the Osaku. And of course, I will serve as your moderator today. Osaku is the international platform uh, that defends and supports the Moroccan Sahara. This platform brings together 3,000 members from all over the world. Among them, there are uh, lawyers, academics, journalists, and civil society actors who, as I said, support the initiative for the negotiation of a statute of autonomy for the Moroccan Sahara region as the one and only solution to the regional dispute over the Moroccan Sahara. Uh, we, in this platform, believe that the Moroccan Autonomy Initiative is the only solution that can guarantee the exercise of the right to self-determination of the population of the Moroccan Sahara. And uh, in many occasions, we called on the international community represented by the Security Council to support the search for a, a realistic, uh, practicable and enduring political solution that rests on compromise to the regional dispute over the Moroccan Sahara on a single and exclusive basis of the Moroccan Autonomy Initiative. We always remain committed to, to, to defending the Moroccanity of the Sahara and the preeminence of the uh, Moroccan Autonomy Initiative in academia, the media and civil society uh, in the respective countries of the members of the OSACO. Always uh, welcoming with a lot of satisfaction the momentum created by Morocco in the last few months, especially the virtual ministerial conference co-organized by Morocco and the United States on January 15, uh, 2021 in which uh, some uh, 40 countries participate to, participated to support the initiative of the autonomy under the Moroccan sovereignty as the only option to definitely resolve this regional dispute. Uh, and uh, the historic decision of the United States, States to fully recognize Morocco's sovereignty over its Sahara is in fact a decision that emanates from a democratic world power, a permanent member of the, the UN Security Council uh, and a, a guarantor of a world order based on international law. We do also believe that the continuous dynamic of the openings of the consulates general by several countries in Layoun and Dakhla consolidates the position of the southern Moroccan provinces as a regional and the continental economic hub. Um, hub. Uh, this uh, 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 um, second episode of the Osaku debates aims at bringing to limelight what has been achieved in the Moroccan Sahara since uh, its independence. And we're really uh, happy to bring uh, 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 this brilliant and eminent speakers, a panel of uh, speakers from different backgrounds uh, whose remarks uh, will contribute uh, to enrich the debate uh, over uh, what has been, as I said, achieved and these um, development endeavors that have been undertaken by, by uh, Morocco to develop uh, the socioeconomic uh, uh, structures uh, in the Moroccan Sahara and uh, of course enhance access to rights of the local population. Uh, among speak speakers, uh, uh, have today with us Irina Zuckerman, who is a human rights uh, lawyer, geopolitical analyst, and editor in chief of the Washington Outsider. Thank you, uh, dear Irina, for accepting our invitation to have you with us today. There is also um, Eric Cameron, uh, who is uh, the president of uh, World Refugee Forum from from Norway. Thank you, uh, Eric, for accepting our invitation. It's a pleasure having you again with us today. Uh, 
there is also Shaybata Murabbi Rabbu. He's a, uh, one of the uh, elected representatives of the local uh, population in the Moroccan Sahara, also the president of the Sahara Center for Studies and Research in Development and Human Rights. Uh, thank you, uh, Shaybata, for accepting our invitation. So, as I said, um, uh, the title of the uh, episode of Osaku Debate is Decolonized uh, uh, Sahara, uh, a thriving land since 1975. Uh, a lot of work has been done, plans targeting this, this region of Morocco to uh, like uh, consolidate the development, the social economic development of these provinces. Um, without any further ado, I will give the floor to Irina uh, Zuckerman to give her remarks uh, about this uh, topic that we are tackling uh, today. The floor is yours, Irina. Thank you so much. I am very honored to be here and uh, I'm, I'm glad to join uh, uh, such knowledgeable people in, in this discussion. Today, I'll focus a little bit on the political discourse and disinformation uh, regarding the concept of, uh, of Sahara and decolonization. Um, unfortunately, there's been a lot of misunderstanding, particularly in the United States uh, about the subject. It is not a well-known uh, situation in the US and up until the Trump administration recognition of Moroccan sovereignty over Western Sahara. This was a subject largely relegated to political and uh, uh, minimally, I would say, academic circles, mostly political uh, circles in the State Department, and that's about it. So let's start with debunking some myths here. Uh, but before we can debunk them, we should identify what they are. Um, Algerian-backed lobbies in Europe and the United States and elsewhere around the world as well have tried to push the idea that Sahara, that Western Sahara is the last colony in Africa. This myth has had legal, political, public relations and human rights implications for the status of this territory. Legally speaking, announcing that something is a colony implicates the state actor in the idea of occupying somebody else's territory and exploiting their resources. This is not a concept that is uh, compatible with the international law in the modern world. Politically, it created frictions within the African Union and beyond the African Union, creating the impression that Morocco is a, uh, is, is a Western state uh, but basically in the style of European colonialists that is imposing itself upon independent populations and creating uh, an imperialist uh, uh, and further imperialist goals in Africa. Uh, 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 so that, that in itself was quite damaging. From PR's perspective, it's just not a good look for liberation movements around the world. So, he, so it furthered a continuity of propaganda uh, uh, around groups of people who otherwise had nothing to do with North Africa, had, did not have any in-depth understanding of the issues here, but latched on to the world colony to uh, um, as, as something that they could relate to their own grievances abroad. And from a human rights perspective, generally speaking, human rights NGOs and media could be mobilized using this concept uh, to attack Morocco at every opportunity because a colony uh, implies the use of force to subjugate uh, people who live there to the will of an authoritarian um, and external leadership that has nothing to do with the right to self-determination by the local population. So these four repercussions had been the legacy of a successful political discourse in position, successful disinformation that has been going on for decades. And for those who, uh, who are not familiar with the concept, it started at the root of a Soviet um, Cold War, 
Cold War struggle between um, pro-Soviet pro Algeria and uh, Western-oriented Morocco. The reality, of course, is that groups of people who were supposed to be fighting colonization by Spain of this territory, Polisario, had been weaponized to create against Morocco to create the false impression that the country indigenous to the region was somehow colonizing the people who lived in its own territory. Now, that's where things get murky because to the outside world, there's the concept of calling for self-determination seems to be a tantamount to a natural assertion of human rights. What's wrong with a, a group of people wanting to have their own territory? Now, the practical reality is that the totality of the movement that started out as a anti-colonialist opposition to Spain and was then subverted, the totality of, of these people number less than 40,000 people. In reality, that's the practical reality. That doesn't mean that they shouldn't have rights. But the question is, are they, first of all, distinct from Morocco? Do they actually want complete self-determination? And do they have the infrastructure, the leadership, and the wherewithal to make it possible? Or is it going to be a problem for all involved? We have seen the actions of all three entities and other actors involved in this dispute. They speak for themselves. We have seen the actions of Morocco, which since 2015 especially has invested heavily, thanks to the leadership of King Mohammed VI, into the region, uh, pushing for educational opportunities, uh, trainings, uh, jobs, uh, construction, infrastructure, health, and uh, integration of the region into Morocco's totality. This has been a process that has been ongoing. No one will pretend that mistakes had not been uh, made along the way. But since 2015, anyone visiting Dakhla, as I have, can see the results for themselves. Let's look at the opposite, at the at the reality of what colonialism actually means. There are two examples of that in Sahara today, and neither of them is perpetrated by Morocco. One, we can safely say, consists of the Tinduf camps in Algeria, which have not been integrated into Algerian population. These are Moroccan citizens who have a full right to Moroccan citizenship should they return to Morocco, who are living in slave-like conditions. Whenever human rights activists or journalists enter those camps, we never see the photographs. They're given a Potemkin tour of these areas. They're not uh, seeing the conditions in which people actually live, and they talk to in individuals who've been largely indoctrinated. A, a territory that is under control of another country, that is separated from the citizens of that other country, which is exploited for political reason, what is it if not a colony? People who live in Tinduf camps cannot work outside those camps. They are not independent in any way. They do not have independent press. And linguistically, they are Moroccan. Culturally, they are Moroccan. Historically, they share the same history as the tribes who are under the sovereign control of Moroccan, uh, of the Moroccan government. So the question is then, who has colonized who? Who has asserted control? drove groups of Moroccans out of the territories where they shared their family life with other with other families and who has taken them over and submitted them to a forceful um, uh, life under guard in a foreign land that has been Algeria and not Morocco. The second example are the territories of Ceuta and Melilla which has have been under Spanish control uh, for several hundred years, and when Spain withdrew from the remainder of its territories, it has remained under Spanish control. Morocco has asserted that these territories are and should be. Moroccan Spain has claimed 
writes to them for the, because of um, uh, the length of its uh, physical dominion and control over those territories. But let's look at the practical reality. Who is actually guarding the borders of those territories? Morocco bears the financial and security costs of preventing influx of illegal immigration. And we have seen uh, several attempts in the recent months uh, by groups of people from sub-Saharan Africa to, um, to push to those territories and from there uh, to try to make their ways uh, to Europe. Morocco, not Spain, is responsible to prevent this security issue from happening. Now, the question is, why is a European country controlling territories in Africa without annexation, without uh, giving the people their full rights and with discriminating, as we have heard in some of the news stories, against particular citizens there in education and other spheres. If that's not colonialism, what is? Well, it meets every, every definition of colonialism and the people there have not been subjected to, a, to a, any sort of referendum. Now, let's look at actions by Morocco and its autonomy plan for the citizens living there. It has given them an extensive right to self-governance while offering protections from outside threats, which, as we know, are proliferating uh, throughout Africa, unfortunately. And <clears throat> to a large extent, thanks to Polisario's alliance with Hezbollah, Al-Qaeda, ISIS, and local organized crime rings, it has offered them full citizenship, full rights, and financial investments. While maintaining their rights to local subcultures um, and extensive freedom uh, in, uh, in self-governance. That, that is not colonialism. That is governance of a country. And if we are looking at who these tribes are in this, uh, in this area, the people who live there, they're Moroccan. They've been living there before this dispute started. They continue living there now, and none of them want to end up in Sindhuf camps. They're not leaving. They're enjoying their life. They're uh, addressing the issues that they have the same as any other Moroccan citizens. They're not changing their language, and uh, they do not wish to end up in, in enclaves with the lack of infrastructure and governance. Finally, let's look at Polisario leadership. What does it have to offer that would make an argument that they are a force of liberation rather than a tool of somebody else's col colonial colonialist efforts? Have they created these positions for the people they claim to represent? Have they created an infrastructure that is provides them with a governance, with a home, with an ability to self-sustain without assistance from other entities. The question is most certainly not. Without Algerian, continuous Algerian assistance, these entities would have ceased to exist a long time ago, in part because, as we know from recent reports by the European Union, the humanitarian assistance um, uh, provided by EU and others has been diverted and disappeared. And these Polisario leaders who claim to be representing these groups of people, these less than 40,000 people, are not even living with their own um, citizens. So they are living in various European countries, they have villas, and they're not accessible for comment a lot of the times. And even when they fall ill or suffer their health, they go to Spain for treatment, as we have seen uh, with Brahim Ghali most recently, he snuck into Spain with an Algerian passport. He did not go to a local hospital where his people reside and receive treatment there. He snuck under a, a false name into a European country. So if this is not a completely colonialist use of other people's resources in a misdirection, I don't know what is. But we we have to ask ourselves then what goals are we what, what goals are we pursuing who if if we are seeking to decolonize, decolonize sahara then yes foreign influence should be uh should not be welcomed unless it is a, a, an influence of partnership with the locals asserting 
demands and then letting someone else take the falls for them as Spain has done with Ciudad Melira, that's colonialism. I start subjugating people in a, and using them as a weapon to antagonize another state and create security problems as Algeria has done, that's colonialism. Providing local people with every opportunity to to integrate, to live a successful life, to create their businesses, to welcome investments. That's not colonialism. That's what every country does for its citizenship. And nobody is being held prisoner. Nobody is being forced to stay there. And the resources that are in the area, they benefit everyone equally because these people are considered Moroccan citizens and there's nothing that's being taken away from them. Uh, in that regard, they're given every right, they're given the right to represent themselves. And that 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 is exactly what everyone, all the human rights people, all the civil society people, all the pro-democracy people want to see. They want to see self-representation. They want to see civil society building. They want to see uh, the ability of people to benefit from the local resources. So that's what we have on the table now in terms of the dispute. And the only thing that's standing in the way is a disinformation, false presentation of these facts in a completely false light. And now I hope you have broken through and looked logically at what is going on. We, when we question former prisoners of Polisario, as I have upon my listen to Dakhla, it becomes uh, easy to see that the flow of people, of refugees, goes only in one direction from Tindouf camps to Morocco and not the other way around. There is no huge influx of Moroccans in Sahara under uh, Moroccan control going to Algeria. How come that doesn't happen? Because they don't want to be there. They want to be Moroccan citizens. They see themselves as Moroccans. They see themselves culturally as Moroccan and they prefer that life. They have, they, they're voluntarily making the choice. The people in Tindouf camps don't have that choice. They have to flee secretly in order to make their way back home and meet their families. That's the unfortunate reality that remains to be addressed in public. The, the, this conflict should not even exist. And the United States did absolutely the right thing for supporting Morocco's uh, claim of sovereignty because there is no other claim there. Thank you, Irina, for this very insightful and rich uh, speech. Uh, indeed, uh, you covered mm, very important uh, points, including this misunderstanding that rises from the falsehoods and um, myths uh, uh, propagated but intended to like um, mislead the international community from the reality. That is that there are uh, thousands of people taken hostage in uh, camps that are not refugee camps, but camps of a sequestered population deprived, as you said, of their basic rights, the right to movement, the right to work, and they are not even uh, sensed that we don't know who is there. Uh, the uh, uh, protection mandate of the UNHCR is dysfunctional. The host country does not assume its responsibility to protect this population. While on the other bank, in the Moroccan Sahara, as you said, investments to ensure that the local population enjoy their rights. That this population uh, leads a decent life. Uh, uh, these comparisons help the public understand and have like uh, uh, closing insight in, uh, into the reality on the ground. You talked also about the legacies from the Cold War that gave birth to such an antagonism, this geopolitical rivalry uh, that Algeria is leading, uh, 
and is nurturing, uh, instrumentalizing, of course, uh, human rights, but taking as a puppet in its hands this polisario, that is an armed group who uh, benefits illegally from a de facto devolution of authority from the host country, uh, which is the cover up for all those violations in Chinduf camps. Thank you, Irina, again for this very insightful and um, rich uh, uh, contribution. Uh, without any further ado, I give the floor to to Sheiba uh, Tamrabi Rabu, who is also a, a, a um, someone who will speak for, from below. He's on the ground now. He participates actively in these processes of developing uh, so the socio-economic life there. The floor is yours, Shebeta. I thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ahmed. And I would like also to uh, thank Mrs. Arena for her uh, insightful uh, introduction. And he, actually, she just makes it easier for me now to just go on and shed more light on the uh, efforts that have been done actually since the uh, recuperation of these uh, territories from the Spanish colonization since 1975. Actually, the first elections just a year after 1976 was uh, elections in Morocco and there was an active participation of the uh, Sahrawi people in these elections. And actually since then, the rate of participation in the uh, elections, either the uh, legislative elections or the local elections or regional, etc. The participation, the rate of participation of the Sahrawi population was always high. And I think that the last uh, percentage was uh, something like 80 and over 80 percent of uh, participation. So uh, speaking of this instrument of democracy, which is uh, elections, uh, Morocco has given, as said Mrs. Irina, actually, uh, Morocco have given the uh, Sahrawis the same rights as the people in the north and uh, we have Sahrawis now myself I'm one of the 3,300 elected people that actually represent democratically speaking the Sahrawi people these Sahrawi people 80% uh, to 85% are living in the southern provinces while uh, a 20 15 to 20 percent is living in uh, Tinduf camp, as said Mr. Ahmed in a sequestrated camps. So we are not only participating in elections, we are taking part in the decision that concerns us. And I like very much what, what Mrs. Irina said about the self uh, governance. Indeed, we do uh, have a freedom in our uh, self-governance because we do not only participate we are or we are just a tool being used but we do participate in the elaboration of the plans development plans and we have serious plans and huge plans that may, normally in five ten years we can see another level which uh, call it the high speed towards development but not any type of development it is sustainable development. When we speak about sustainable development, we also speak about the future generations. So the policies that have been uh, implemented in here are not only targeting the, the existing people, but also the future. Speaking of economy, do we ask the question from where we get the uh, electricity or from where we get the uh, water? We, we get access to desalinate the seawater in order to keep the uh, aquifer and in, in order to keep the uh, underground waters for the um, next generation. Uh, in regards to electricity, we have one of the biggest parks of um, uh, windmills in, in Africa. It's here in the Sahara. We have the uh, solar uh, energy and we are hoping to have greener energy in the future. Speaking about another segment of the economy, which is the industries and the to, tourism, et cetera. I think that this is coming with the new port of Dakla, that we have one of the biggest ports in Africa, and it indeed would serve as a basis for the uh, north-south uh, economy, not to speak about uh, east-west. And I think that we can go uh, on giving examples of the participation of the population in the uh, main sectors of economy. If we speak about the phosphate, which is one of the main uh, sectors in the Sahara actually, which is run by Sahrawis. When we speak about fisheries, same thing. 
most of the owners and the, the workers and the, of the sellers and the vendors, etc., in this um, segment of economy is actually run, directed by the uh, uh, local population. We're not here to defend any kind of uh, position because me as a Sahrawi, and I know that I'm speaking at least on behalf of the majority of the Sahrawis living here, we, we, we don't need a recognition from the international economy to say that we are Moroccans or not. We do know that we are Moroccans and historically speaking, we've been Moroccans and there is no existence of any other country in this territory or any other state, if you want to say, before Moroccans in 12 centuries. And uh, I think that the United States of America and the administration of the United States have actually understood this uh, deep relation with a strategic ally uh, 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 positioned in the Northwest Africa, the gate to, to Africa. And I think that this is just a recognition of these historical uh, relations between Morocco and the States. And uh, the recognition of the United States is there, not only the United States, but uh, many other countries. Every day we hear countries that either they already opened a consulate somewhere in the Sahara or are planning to uh, indeed open a, a, a consulate. So uh, the political position, I think Morocco is, is, in, a, is in, a good, in a good position in regards to this artificial issue. As said, Mrs. Zerina, it, it is indeed the result of the Cold War and we do know the context from where it comes, these uh, separatist groups. But today, today, we do have a, a region that is growing, that is prospering, that, is, uh, that knows many, many, many uh, activities that have been recognized by the international community. At the other side, as said uh, again, Mrs. Zirina, we do have the uh, information from the Tindouf camps and how frustrated the people are and how uh, desperate these people are and are seeking uh, a way to reach Morocco. And just to give you a number, uh, it's over 20,000 people that have already uh, joined Morocco. They are joining us, enjoying together the uh, fruits of what have been already, uh, already done. When it comes to the uh, civil society, we in the Sahara, I do myself, I do work as, as a social activist and as a human rights defender, etc. I see that Morocco not only have helped the people to understand their context and to run their businesses and to do the uh, practice of self governance, but it goes beyond. We do have now what we call a social engineering. Uh, that when you see the number of cooperative, women cooperative, children cooperative, or associations, etc then you understand that Morocco not only stepped towards like giving the right to others to express themselves, but, but goes beyond to give them the right to plan, execute, and uh, judge the results together with uh, uh, the, uh, what do we call it, the uh, criterion uh, of success. When we come to the solution, the autonomy, the autonomy is not an idea of the king of Morocco or an idea of the government of Morocco or an idea of it's the idea of the local population. We do believe, strongly believe that the autonomy is the only solution. And you said it very well, Mrs. Zerin, and when you, when you differentiated between the annexation and the colonization, Morocco has never been a colonized country. Morocco is not a, a European uh, country that has history with colonization. Morocco has always been in its territory and the opposite, it has been cut from its territory during the uh, French colonization of uh, uh, Algeria. So uh, we, we are not here in an approach of colonization at all. We are here into an approach of integration and Morocco has been doing it very well. And I think that the um, recognition of many, many countries, uh, and also I would just to mention this, the verdict that has that come from uh, the Far East, from New Zealand, about a certain cargo of phosphate that have been discussed legally, and comes out the decision of the uh, National Court of New Zealand to say that indeed this uh, type of uh, merchandise belong to the uh, local people, belong to the uh, future of the kids of this uh, territory. And in this way, it gives the right to Morocco to continue doing its trade uh, classically as has been done uh, in the past. So 
uh, today, we do still have um, something missing. What is missing is exactly what ended uh, Mrs. Irina again. And I'm sorry to get back to you uh, every time because I actually have said it and said it well, that we, we still miss that our cousins, brothers and sisters in Tindur joins us. We want this artificial issue to be uh, ended. So as our people come to join with us together, what we have been uh, jo joining so far, and it will never be complete unless we uh, see them together with us participating in the future of our, of our territory and of our country, Morocco, and afterwards the Maghreb Arab, which is a union that is suffering. It cannot take off because of this uh, artificial issue and the uh, Algerian stubbornness towards this, um, to the, to this issue that it keeps on and keeps on and keeps on helping and investing money while we see the reality of the Algerian people and how they suffer with their daily life. And I just mentioned, for example, the water crisis in the capital Algiers. So uh, we cannot uh, get our people thirst and getting thirsty, no water. And at the same time, we invest billions and billions of uh, petrodollar towards the um, a project which is uh, proven to be uh, a failure. So I would like to thank Osaku for this uh, chance and this occasion given to me to speak with these uh, uh, in this uh, platform. But at the same time, I would like to use this platform to launch an appeal that we do need to put the needed pressure uh, on, on the Algerian uh, government, on the Algerian uh, authorities, so as they liberate our sons and sisters. And let me tell you that Sahara has always been Moroccan, and we as Sahrawis, we as legal representative of the local population, do believe that it is Moroccan. And if it needs, we don't need any kind of other uh, recognition or anything, because we are Sahrawis, we will be Sahrawis, and uh, as our parents, our grandparents have been, they presented their uh, relations and their uh, love to the um, central government and to the kings of Morocco, since uh, centuries and that's how we will remain and i think that the morocco today is in a very good position to in in this uh, artificial issue and i thank you again osako uh, for this participation thank you irina and thank you mr Riri. thank you very much uh, mr shebata for for uh, this uh, uh, speech this testimony i would consider it uh, that uh, introduces uh, figures uh, concrete examples of the uh, achievements uh, in the Moroccan Sahara, uh, sustained development, uh, green solutions. We gave examples of how the local population uh, participates uh, from within the, the process. Uh, uh, the process that uh, aims in a few years to make, to put, to put the Moroccan Sahara on the international map as a platform for international commerce, as a, 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 a real uh, uh, platform for South, South, South cooperation. The question is, does this development touch on the, the local uh, population needs? Yes. It does. Do, uh, do they have a say in decisions? Yes, they do. An example of that. You are an elected representative and you participate, as I said, uh, from within the, the, the institutions to craft decisions, to bring plans that live up to the expectations of the local population in the management of, 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 the, of the local affairs. And that's the heart of the right to self-determination principle. OSACO, the abbreviation for the autonomy for the Sahara coalition, uh, 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 tries to like correct these distortions, these misunderstandings about the autonomy plan. The autonomy plan is a real incarnation of the right to self-determination that is linked to the free will. That is the free will. To be able to choose who can speak for you, to be able to make decisions that concern your immediate uh, 
uh, uh, life. And of course, this meeting principles of the UN Security Council resolutions. Thank you, Dershay Peter, for, for, for your, your, your contribution. Uh, I move uh, quickly to uh, Eric Cameron. Uh, of course, Eric is more concerned about the humanitarian situation in the Tindouf camps. Uh, the floor is yours, Eric. Thank you very much. Before I um, uh, continue with my planned messages, let me commend the leadership, the men and the women of uh, Moroccan Sahara. I've had the pleasure with my own eyes seeing what explosive development and optimism and fighting spirit has been exposed there and who prom that promises very, very bright and strong future for the population in Morocco and Sahara. From my full heart, I wish you the best of luck and hope that it can continue with even more strength than it has been so far. Uh, <clears throat> however, I am to speak on the, the situation uh, the background and the challenges uh, that meet the population or the camp population uh, in Tindouf. And at this time of pandemic, uh, I, 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 pandemic, I would like to call the attention of the audience to the excruciating conditions of the Tindouf camp population that is denied international protection for the full enjoyment of their rights. It is very important to remind the audience that Polisario has been devolved by its host country, the authority on a, on a part of its territory in violation of the Refugee Status Convention of 1951 and its 1967 protocol, as well as all conclusions of the Executive Committee of the United Nations Commissioner for Refugees. <clears throat> this situation that is exceptional in regard to international human rights law allows Paul Polisario to perpetrate systematic human rights violations in the Tindouf camps in order to crush any challenge to his legitimacy, thus arbitrary detention kidnappings and torture perpetrated with the active complicity of the host state uh, are part of everyday life in the civilian population. During the last meeting uh, of the, uh, the 46th session of the Human Rights Council, the Sharabi Human Rights Defender, Mr. Adnan Brai, stressed that thousands of Sahrawis have been condemned to silence in the camps of Tindouf, where the Polisario and its armed militia are sowing terror. In this context, we are all very concerned about the whereabouts of Mr. Ahmed Khalil Rai, who disappeared for more than 12 years ago for having voiced his opposition to the Polisario leadership. We will appreciate if the Polisario members here present can provide us uh, and his family with any element of information about Mr. Brahi. Is he dead or is he alive? Despite consistent warning from the United States Secretary General and NGOs, the rights violations continue and the situation of the sequestered population in the Tindouf camps is far from improving. The host state uh, bearer is the holder of specific obligations to prevent, investigate, and punish violations of the rights of the persons in its territory while ensuring legal redress. Therefore, it is moral, legal, and penal responsibility is fully engaged. The UN Human Rights Council expressed in 20, 
18 it's concerned with the facto devolution of authority to Polisario, especially jurisdictional authority. The world has to denounce firmly the embezzlement by host country and Polisario humanitarian and intended for the civil population uh, uh, rights, which, which the UNHCR and the World Food Programme have denounced following a joint inspection mission led in 2005. Two UN agencies led this mission upon the instigation of the EU Director General for European Civil Protection and Humanita uh, Humanitarian Aid, which decided to half its humanitarian aid to the Tindouf camp's population after having noted embezzlement practices in the camps. In 2007, it was the European Anti-Fraud Office turn to voice concerns over the embezzlement of humanitarian aid by Algerian officials and Polisario. Since then, embezzlement continues at the same pace as the expense at the expense of the health of the civilian population of the Tindouf camps. No later than June 9th, 2020, NGO Light and Justice launched an appeal to the European Union for ending the illicit uh, enrichment of Polisario members through human humanitarian aid embezzlement. Then this same NGO underlined that due to the sale of most humanitarian aid in some neighboring countries, which is now a well-documented phenomenon, hunger and thirst haunt the inhabitants of the Tindouf camps. The systematic embezzlement of humanitarian aid with total impunity is only made possible by the stubborn refusal of the host state to allow the conducting of a UNHCR-led census of the Tindouf camp populations in defiance of all resolutions adopted by the Security Council since 2011. Conducting a census is a statutory obligation of UNHCR and a fundamental protection mechanism. The European Parliament denounced in a resolution in a, uh, it adopted on April the 29, 2000, 2015, the absence of a census of the Tindouf camp population more than 30 years after their arrival on Algerian soil, nothing that is abnormal, unique, a, and a unique situation in the history of the UNHCR. Many reports published by the uh, Amnesty International Human Rights Watch are clearly denouncing the OPAC situation in the Tindouf camps controlled by the Polisario. Amongst these are uh, particularly, the host country has abandoned its responsibility for the human rights violations committed by the Polisario on its territory. Polisario monopolizes political discourse and persecutes those who directly question or oppose its leadership on fundamental issues. Polisario must put an end to practices of slavery, in particular against sub-Saharan populations. Access to information about the situation on the ground is limited, exposing residents to the risk of human rights abuses. Isolation of the population and the lack of regular monitoring in the field of respect for human rights. No actions are taken to end the impurity enjoyed by those responsible for human rights abuses committed in the Tindouf camps. Many arbitrary arrests and detentions are occurring. We can cite the case of Mr. Mohamud Zaidan, 
who was held in detention for 24 hours and questions about internet posts in which he can criticize the way the authorities handle the distribution of help related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Polisario has no longer any credibility because of the reigning of General Secretary in the ruling class. There are so many divisions among the members of the Polisario and we can observe the emergence of dissident movements criticizing these advocated by the Polisario, which belongs to another area, era. The international community has so responsibility to voice concerns over the fate of the population that is deprived of protection in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, as the host country delegated the management of the health situation in the tin roof camps to Polisario and armed groups that have neither the legal authority nor the technical capacity to protect the population against the disease. The tent of camp, camps continue to be a singular situation and an atypical case in the humanitarian world. Indeed, a census of the population in the tent of has never been conducted as we have already have heard, and the population has never been registered by UNHCR, as the case is in all other humanitarian situations. Moreover, the figures used by the UNHCR to qualify aid has remained almost unchanged for some four and a half decades. For almost half a century, the Polisario and the host country have been refusing systematically and categorically the requests of the UNHCR to conduct the census of the Sahrawi population in the tentative camps. In order to clarify the situation and enable UNHCR to fulfill duly its mandate in the tentative camp, Morocco has been calling since the 1970s upon uh, UNHCR are to conduct a transparent and reliable census of the population of the camps. Conducting a census is a statutory obligation of the UNHCR, as we already have heard, uh, that has been also confirmed by numerous UN General Assembly resolutions on refugee and several recommendations of, of the Executive Committee of the UNHCR which constitute the legal basis for the census. It's a prerequisite of the UNHCR's mandate, consisting particularly in protecting refugees and extending them required humanitarian aid. The UN Security Council resolution adopted uh, called upon the UNHCR to register the population of attentive camps. The prohibition of the UNHCR from fulfilling its statutory obligations must go neither trivialized nor glossed over the reports and for the assessment of the humanitarian situation in the tentative camps. General Assembly resolutions on refugee call upon states since 2004 to put in place, quote, effective registration systems and censuses as a tool of protection and as a mean for the quantifications and assessment of the needs of the provision and distribution of humanitarian assistance and to implement appropriate durable solutions." End quote. A UNHCR-led census is mandatory for the effective management of humanitarian aid, since it enables UNHCR to fill, fulfill the following functions according to the work of the Executive Committee. One, obtain better knowledge of the situation in order to improve the delivery uh, of assistance and respond to the real needs of the most vulnerable groups. Two, raise most 
aid among most aid among donor uh, for food programs. Three, prevent humanitarian aid embezzlements. And four, put in place more detailed plans and more transparent management of food aid. The mandate of the UNHCR is clear. It must supply to the host country of the population of the youth camps without any restrictions and in accordance with the legal and humanitarian parameters defined by international refugee law, just as to all other refugee situations in the world. In the absence of a reliable census, humanitarian aid is not based on any verifiable data. In 2005, pending a serious uh, census, the World Food Programme and the UNHCR decided to grant their assistance to the population estimated at 90,000 people. However, according to various assessments of the size of the population by demogra demographic experts based on satellite images and witness accounts, the Polisario officials uh, uh, of the Polisario officials, the number of the population in the Tindu camp does not exceed 40,000 people. In the international community and the major donors are therefore called upon to take a more responsible stance and to exert pressure to persuade the host country to allow the UNHCR to carry out a census. It can't be overstated the responsibility of the host state and the ongoing tragic situation to which the Tindouf camps are the silent victims for over four decades and a half. It is our collective duty to voice concern and to take the appropriate measures to put an end to the suffering. Eric, thank you very much. You exposed the re responsibilities. Who is to hold accountable for the situation in Team Comes? From an international law point of view, Algeria has the responsibility over what is happening in these camps. The enforced disappearances, including the recent one of El Khalil Ahmed, who was a former uh, polisario leader, he disappeared in 2011 in one of the military jails in Algiers. The arbitrary detentions against human rights defenders and bloggers and opinion leaders in this country. They depriving the, this population of the camps from their rights, their basic rights as provided for in international conventions. And also the diversion of the diversion of humanitarian aid. You highlighted a very, very important point the protection of human rights starts necessarily by a census, as you said. This census will help the international community identify who is there in these camps, their needs, be it children, be it old people, be it youth. And the census will help this, I mean, the, 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 the stakeholders at the international level to intervene in a prosperant, uh, 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 let's say, uh, um, adequate manner to, to like meet the needs of this of this of this of this uh, population. Algeria's responsibility is 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 undeniable. Uh, from international law, as you said, the UN Human Rights Committee has uh, uh, stated clearly that this, this host country should assume its responsibility regarding 
what is happening in these camps. Uh, uh, this second episode of Osako debates um, uh, comes to provide any questions the regional disputes for Sahara, but how can provide an uh, realistic one? Realism is in first. Uh, providing a decent life to the local population, and then tackling the issues of, uh, of uh, human rights violations in chain of camps, and uh, stressing this, I mean, Algeria's responsibility and meddling in this regional conf uh, conflict. In the end, I'd like to thank you all. Uh, Irina Tsokraman, Shaiba Tamarab Yarabwant, Eric Cameron, thank you for the time you invested and um, your effort and uh, your availability uh, to join us in uh, today's webinar. Uh, I thank uh, the audience who also joined us to follow the debate and certainly there will be more, more debates in the future. Osako uh, will uh, we'll do our best to uh, enrich the, the debates on uh, the Moroccan Sahara and of course uh, always um, uh, bringing to limelight the real responsibilities. Thank you very much, and um, we meet you uh, soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.